All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to another episode of the Love Hope Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. I am the author of Love Hope Lime, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. Every two weeks on Monday, I post a new Love Hope Lime podcast. In it, people can listen to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever they get their podcasts. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please be uh, nice and give me a five-star review. I would greatly appreciate it. We have a lot of people who listen or watch it, I should say, on YouTube. So if you're watching today's podcast on YouTube, feel free to give me a thumbs up. Give me a comment. I would greatly appreciate it. I also uh, I'm up on Facebook. People are welcome to link uh, to connect with me on Facebook. I'm also very active in it on LinkedIn. And by the way, the book has been free. The, P, the PDF, the e-version of the book has been free. It always will be. For Lyme survivors, reach out to me via Facebook Messenger, or if you're connected to me on LinkedIn, reach out to me on LinkedIn. In it, I've given out over a thousand PDF copies of the book. I want it out there. It's gone all over the world. It's been in Australia. I get people in Poland, Holland, all across the United States, of course, Israel, people who, uh, England, people who are just trying to find answers on what they should be doing and, and how they can be supporting people that they love. Now, one of the cool things about uh, my journey to understand Lyme is that I've met amazing people. I've met many advocates, doctors, people on the political side of Lyme disease, believe it or not, people who run communities. And I was just blown away at how many people have devoted so much time and energy to supporting the Lyme community, one such person, that I was fortunate uh, fortunate to meet is Enid Haller. She started the Lyme Center of Martha's Vineyard. I know you were very much involved with the quiet epidemic. We had Lindsay Keys on the show. I actually have done book signings at four different showings of the quiet epidemic. And uh, every time I've watched, I've, you've probably watched it more than me, but I've watched it four times. Every time I watch it, I get angrier as when I see the history of, of Lyme and and everything. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. So uh, again, Enid, give us a little bit of a background on your Lyme journey, why you've gotten so involved with the Lyme Center of Martha's Vineyard and the work that you've done to, to help produce the, the documentary and, and everything else that you're doing. Yes. Thank you for having me today. Um, yeah, I've been a Lyme advocate since 2008 because that's when uh, I found out that I had Lyme and my daughter and my husband. So we were living um, at Martha's Vineyard. We had, uh, I was in New York City before that, practicing, uh, having a psychology and so I'm a psychologist and social worker. So I had a, a clinic in Manhattan for over 10 years, uh, treating attention deficit disorder and uh, addictive behavior, holistically without medication. And so I, that's when I got started getting sick. And I started to just notice there was something wrong. I couldn't, I couldn't get through the day anymore. I had to stop seeing patients, and um, that, and the same thing was happening with my daughter and my husband. We thought, well, did we get like you know, in a, a bad problem from nine eleven smoke or something? I mean, you know, we didn't know what it was, and so we decided to leave Manhattan. Um, you know, after I after I'd lived there for twenty four years. Um, and moved to Martha's Vineyard, which was our, our second home pretty much because we would go there for, um, you know, uh, holidays and everything. And, um, so my, my, uh, daughter was the first one to not, to get really ill. Um, and she wasn't able to walk. Uh, she became bed bedridden, uh, in our house in Martha's Vineyard when she was nine years old. So she didn't have a um birthday party that year you know that was the that, that was the first time that she couldn't get out of bed to even have a, a birthday party and her friends you know came and dropped off presents it was terrible but we, i was told that she had mono and so then this went on for months and then and finally i knew something else was wrong and it was a friend of mine brooke adams i used to be an actress in, in mm. Manhattan, so and a model and i knew um some you know people in Brooke Adams and Tony Shalhoub are, are married and they live up the street from us in Martha's Vineyard. Hmm. They gave me the film of um, Under Our Skin. Yeah. 
this premiered in the Martha's Vineyard Film Festival that summer. Hmm. So it's the exact time that that was in the film festival that my daughter was suffering from the, something mysterious, you know, that no one knew. And so, uh, sure enough, uh, we we sent away for an IGNX test, and she came back very positive. The pediatrician at the hospital did not believe us. Um, she said the test was not positive, that it was negative. She didn't know how to read the test. So um, she said, it's definitely not Lyme. And, you know, I just knew it was. And so that's when we actually got in touch with, um, you know, the wonderful Dr. Charles Ray Jones, the pediatrician in New Haven, who has passed now. Yeah. But he... Um, he he was a miracle worker. He took my daughter in. We we got her there right away. He got her on. She, yes, she had Babesia, Bartonella, and Lyme. Um, we were there for three hours the first visit, and he figured everything out in that time, and gave her about five different antibiotics, which I I was desperate at this time because she couldn't walk, you know, anymore, and I would try anything at this point. And uh, sure enough, in about two months, she was up walking and fine. <laughs> you know, like it was it was miraculous, actually. So I think she hadn't had it for that long, you know, maybe a year or so. And that's why she was able to bounce back, you know, quicker. I mean, she's, it took two years of treatment with Dr. Horowitz to get her mm. completely, you know, functioning well. But that's when we, we realized, my God, we should test ourselves. And sure enough, we both had Lyme. We were off the charts, you know, with Igenex as well, my husband and myself. And we found that he had been uh, sick, had been bitten, you know, when he was 14 years old. And he had Bell's palsy in his face when he went back to New Jersey uh, after a summer vacation. And, the, and he was bitten in summer camp in Martha's Vineyard. And that's when we found out how bad the ticks were in Martha's yes. Vineyard. And it was like ground zero for Lyme. And yes. we didn't know that. So I started studying it and that was the beginning. And we found Dr. Horowitz right away. And it was easy back then, 2008, to get in to see him, of course, um, because, you know, no one really knew Dr. Horowitz yet. So, uh, but he uh, took us all in uh, on a Saturday, if you can believe it, three hours, each of us. He, he spent nine hours with us with, um, with my, and, you know, helped all three of us. It was, it was incredible. I've never seen a doctor like that ever in my life, spend that kind of time and care that much, you know, about patients. So it, I really, we got better because of him, you know, Charles Ray Jones was great too, you know, to get yeah. us started, but um, Dr. Holmes was able to take uh, being also with us, my daughter, when we started with him, but it was a long road. You know, I had had um, Lyme probably, I don't know, four or five years. I, I don't know how long I, I've had it, you know, back then. Um, I don't know, but my husband definitely had it for a really long time. So <clears throat> it's been 16 years that we've gone to Dr. Horowitz. We're still patients of his. Uh, he's really our primary care and has become our primary care and a close friend. And of course, close to Lee as well, his wife. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Horowitz, for people who were listening here, wrote the foreword to my book, Love, Hope, Lime. As a matter of fact, it was Mother's Day 2022, it was Sunday morning. I opened up my computer and there was one of the most beautiful uh, 10 paragraphs I've, read, I've read. So he was very, very kind to do that. He was also the first guest that we had on the, uh, on the, on the Love, Hope, Lime podcast. A couple of clarifying questions here. So, um, and again, may Dr. Jones rest in peace as well, of course. Uh, yes. Martha's Vineyard, you mentioned Ground Zero. So I've never been to Martha's Vineyard, but I've heard so much about it as a Lyme center. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And again, you know, you, you started the Lyme Center of Martha's Vineyard. It's mostly, you mentioned, phone type service today. But tell us a little bit about Martha's Vineyard. Why is it such a center point for yeah. Lyme and, and then the purpose of the Lyme Center? Yeah, um, well, we we realized that there were pockets uh, in Martha's Vineyard that were really Lyme infested, 
and somehow we had horses we were we, we rode so um we would have to be very careful not to take the horses in certain areas because if we did they'd come back with hundreds of ticks on their legs you know they'd be walking funny back to the barn and we we go what i i see my daughter coming in with her friend on the horse i'm like what the hell is going on here and so and then we had to just pick each one off of the of the horse's legs it took hours to get all the ticks and you know put them into a, a, a jar with us uh, sudsy water is what we did and then after that we were very careful you know to check them and everything and one one horse did have chronic lyme that we had to get treatment for at tufts um uh, and had iv treatment for for her and that and that got her better but um, a lot of the horses die on Martha's Vineyard from Lyme disease and dogs too. It's a, it's really bad. Um, the reason why uh, I don't know, I think because I could, Chris Newby can probably tell you uh, <laughs> that why uh, Martha's Vineyard might've been the drop zone for one of these tick things, who knows, you know, but um, everyone on the Island has Lyme and I'm not kidding you. And it's like everyone and so I started like looking and paying attention and like everybody had memory problems and everybody had, you know, I mean, all the symptoms of Lyme that you can think of, many, many people that I knew were suffering and didn't know they had Lyme. And so that's when I decided well, I've got to do something, I think. And, and I went to the local library to get as many Lyme books as I could, which was like right up the street from where I live. It's a tiny island. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. It's like 15,000 in the summer and 150,000 in, in, in the, you know, I mean, sorry, 15,000 in the winter and 150,000 in, in the, in the summer, you know, like the, it's a summer place like Long Island. Right. So it becomes, you, everybody kind of knows each other. It's a small town, you know, in the yeah. sun, winter time. So, and we were year rounders. And so um, the weird story was I went to the library and the librarian said, are you a doctor? And I was like, no, I'm I'm not a medical doctor. I'm I'm a psychologist. And she's like, well, we need help here. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, I need help. Everybody comes in here every day and says they have Lyme symptoms, they think, and they take out Lyme books. That's why we don't have any Lyme books left. But I have 30 Lyme books here you know, every sorts uh, that, you know, that, that to try to help people. But can you help us in some way? Can you run a support group or do something? And I was like, well, I'm just starting to study it. But yes, I can. After I saw under our skin, I knew exactly that we had Lyme disease. I knew that, you know, that film explained things very well for me. Yeah. And so I did start running under our skin once a month uh and then i i started doing it once a week and it was filled and packed I, I had to do it once a week run that film and then we'd have a discussion afterwards and i did that for a year you know just to start educating the community because nobody knew what to do no one and i sent everybody to horowitz and i mean and he was available because you know he wasn't filled up like he got you right, know yeah. in demand so everybody went to horowitz and uh started to get better you know, and, and it, it started. To, and so we had a Lyme support group. Then we moved over to a little uh, house <laughs> right next to the library. And the Lyme support group, you know, started to grow, grow, grow bigger. And uh, and that was once a month. I ran that every uh, Wednesday and it would go for like three hours. And it turned out to be almost eleven hundred people on the email list. You know, when I uh, when I count, when I when I counted, you know, only after like a year. So, I mean, that it was amazing how many people on the island, you know, had this disease and really had no idea what to do about it. I mean, it was crazy. So then I started the Lyme Center of Martha's Vineyard. We had a little guest house because then people could come in. I could hand out the free Igenix test to them, you know, and then we got a doctor to draw blood, you know, on the on the vineyard for this and uh, which they didn't before. But it was okay, and then actually, then we then we got Martha's Vineyard Hospital to draw blood for Igenix too. Was, and then Lindsay came along, and this was like after I had had the tick-borne disease working group, <clears throat> a little bit of friction there as well. Yeah. Um, there was some conflicts between advocates that happened that was very strange. Um, there were. Um, I was accused of something that I didn't do. Um, mm. There was supposed to be a mole in the tick-borne disease working group subcommittee I was on. 
the first year. Yeah. And I um, basically dropped out. You know, I just thought this is not helpful. Um, and that's a, another story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you just, you run into so many weird things in the Lyme community. And I, I think it's leveled out a little bit. I mean, yeah. I was always trying to not make any enemies at all and always trying to just smooth things over. But things are, I think, gotten a lot better than they used to be. People seem to be working with each other um, in, a, in a better way. So you um, mentioned that, uh, you know, a, a couple number of years ago, there was almost everybody you said had Lyme in, in Martha's Vineyard. What's it like today? Is it similar? Yeah. <clears throat> because of some of these people that have been um, fighting uh, yeah. the, um, you know, it's like <clears throat> they tell, I would, I would say something to the Martha's Vineyard Times or the yeah. newspaper. They would always interview me if there was ever a Lyme thing. And, and then I'd have my opinion. And then they'd interview this other gentleman I was speaking of, you know, from Tufts, who Chris knew yeah. we met. And, um, and he would negate everything I said, yeah. you know, about Lyme. So that, you know, there's no chronic Lyme. It doesn't exist. Hmm. Uh, you, you know, this is all made up. These people are crazy. Like that kind of stuff. So that, that was the fight that was going on, you know, all over the world, you know, yeah. that, you know, it's, and especially on Martha's Vineyard, it was happening. So nobody, I mean, uh, the patients knew that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah, <clears throat> They knew that I, you know, wasn't making this up. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think uh, what happened was, you know, just the patients started getting better <laughs> going to Dr. Horowitz. And there was another wonderful person who put, who would put, put in pick lines just in Providence which was an hour away chris um her, her name was um it's the lime center of uh, new england they're great okay. and uh she can do anything she's amazing susan newber is her name yeah. and i would send patients i've sent hundreds of pe people to her so um to, for us to get better we basically followed the horowitz protocol um i did get a pick line because i had neurological lyme very severe and I moved to Boston under Dr. Lansman, who Catherine Lansman in Boston gave me a pick line for two years. That made everything completely clear in my brain and the pressure in my skull went away for the first time. Oh. Right after that, we went to Germany for the hyperthermia oh. treatment at the St. George Clinic, my husband and I. <sighs> and that was a very brutal, a very difficult treatment. And we were the first to go. We were like the guinea pigs from yeah. Boston. No one had gone there before. And, but through the Lyme Center, uh, through Brandy uh, Dean's Center that I helped, uh, you know, I volunteered there for the first two years and with Dr. Uh, Dr. Nev, uh, she she was amazing. Um, we, uh, we went, I was a patient there also at the Lyme Center. I was patient number one because <laughs> I knew when it, when it was gonna open. You know, Brandy told me, and so uh, you know, I I wanted to try to be the first patient for the first Lyme Center in, in Boston, which actually functioned extremely well for the first five years and, and did a lot of good. Yeah, you've been you've been through so much. Um, it's yeah. it's just incredible as you're saying some of the things here. Uh, help explain again. We have two types of people listening to today's podcast. Yeah, there are family members and friends, hopefully, who love someone and want to learn more. Yeah. And we also have a lot of Lyme survivors I've come to learn, Enid. Again, we're talking today with Enid Hauer, uh, who were looking for ways to get more support. You know, one of the reasons why I wrote the book, Love, Hope, Lyme, was I would see on Facebook, uh, nobody's there for me anymore, or my spouse left, or my parents don't believe me. You know, you had mentioned before about a particular doctor who was leading the way in that type of a communication. And you're the 800th person I've spoken to who has given me that background as well. And it's, it's insanity to me that there is this disease. It's very clear what it does, that people are disputing the reality of a disease, which is just absolutely ridiculous. But what would you like what are three things that you would like to tell two or three things you'd like to tell those who have someone in their world with Lyme, what their loved one is going through? Oh yeah. Um, I literally still talk to people uh, every week. You know, it used to be several people every day, you know, when I was running the hotline, I mean, uh, for a good 10 years, 
I, I don't know how, I probably talked to, I don't know, thousands of people from every country. And now that um, I, I, I've had neck surgery uh, eight months ago, um, and I'm still recovering from from that. And I think it's related to Lyme as well, because the collagen, we all have pains in our neck. And yes. I would I would suggest to people, um, please check your neck out and your vertebrae, because a lot of times um, the x-rays are not read properly like it was like what happened to me. So I had the severe neck pain for a long time. I couldn't get rid of. That was the one symptom that was very difficult for me to get rid of even though I felt great in the other, you know, I had, I had the array of symptoms that everyone uh, complains about. Um, and they, all of them subsided pretty well, except for this neck pain and the neck pain seemed to be getting worse, you know, every, every year. And so finally I got a surgeon to, 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 to do x-rays here at Dartmouth Hitchcock and he showed me my x-rays like no one had ever done this before correctly from the side and I was bone on bone in five vertebrae. So all the collagen had been eaten away, uh, which is what we we know Lyme likes to do. You know, like uh, there's um, hip surgeries all the time, knee surgeries, and now neck surgery mm. is very common, um, I think with Lyme patients to have, make sure you check that out because you're a lot of Lyme patients, um, unfortunately, you know, have to turn to painkillers or something to live with that pain, you know, in, in their neck. And, 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 and uh, it could be that you are bone on, on bone and look into that because if you are, you can, there is surgery, you know, that you can get to, and I had five vertebrae fused. That's a lot. I had to yeah. go to Mass General to have that done, but I truly believe that it was a uh, uh, conducive to have, you know, it was connected to Lyme disease in some, some way. Um, I think that that's one thing I would pass on. And, you know, the other thing of course, is to always find, you know, a Lyme literate doctor, because if you, if you try even a little bit to go through the system, unfortunately, you know, it just never really works yet. Um, we just don't have, you know, people are just still not educated about this and, it's a really sad story because you have to pay out of pocket and it's really a terrible thing for people that can't afford this treatment. And there's still not an answer for people that can't afford this treatment. And we have to fix that problem somehow. I, I agree. Mean, I, yeah. I think we have to find a way, you know, to fund treatment for people somehow. Um, I mean, I am, you know, talking to a few people now, I, Lindsay, I think, mm -hmm. and Bonnie is, is connected to Lindsay. I, I did help Lindsay, you know, Lindsay uh, Keys, who made, um, you know, the uh, quiet epidemic. She was, I was the first one she reached out to because she huh. was not Martha's Vineyard. And she was living there when I was living there. We didn't know each other. Wow. <laughs> it's bizarre. And so uh, after she figured out she had Lyme, she said that she found the Lyme Center of Martha's Vineyard. Going, like, what is that? You know, because she didn't know she had Lyme disease until after she left the vineyard, and then she figured huh. it out. And what do I get? And she goes to Horowitz as well. And so, the weird story happened is that she came and visited me, you know, at my my home when I still lived there, and uh, and and saw the Lyme Center and everything, and. And she, uh, she's like, I, I want to make a film, you know, I want to make a documentary. And I said, so do I. <laughs> so we both wanted to, and it was, that's what, how we met. And, you know, that was like, and I just introduced her to basically everyone I knew. And I happened to just know everybody because, you know, I'd gone to Washington. I had met everyone in the Lyme advocacy world. And, uh, you know, so I, and I had everybody's phone numbers. You know, so that's that's how I helped her as, you know, associate producer of that film was pull as many people together for her to talk to and who she wants to film and how and that sort of thing. Well, that's, so that's a it's an amazing story, because, uh, again, we're talking about the quiet epidemic here. Lindsay was a, a guest on the, on the Love Hill Blind podcast. Um, I've done four book signings at at uh, quiet epidemic showing every time I watch the film, I'll be honest with you, I get angrier. You know, that this, everything that we're talking here today with Ian and Howard was able to happen. 
you know, I mean, again, um, when I started my research of Love, Hope, Lime, I had no idea that there was all the things you're talking about, the politics, the inability to test. You know, we also did a show recently with with Bonnie Crater from Center for Live Action, uh, Lime Action. Yep. They just had their virtual uh, fly-in back in February of 2024, where we're trying to get uh, elected Congress to give more funding. You know, she mentioned that the cancer world gets 50 billion per year and in early 2024, it's like 180 million. So thanks for the the great work on The Quiet Epidemic. It, it's a film that, uh, it, first of all, it's a greatly, it's a well done film, you know, from an entertainment, uh, entertainment is the wrong word, from a watching a documentary perspective, but good for you for bringing all those people together. And again, yeah. yeah. The main, the main thing is like, that, which I didn't even know this was going to happen, which was like the coolest thing ever was when I, when, when we lived in New York city, we lived on West 88th street, a block away from Chris Hedges, you know, who had a dog <laughs> and she and Penny, uh, you know, used to walk their dogs. And we met that way at the, at the dog park in central park. So we had been friends for like 10 years while we were, you know, walking our dogs, you know, and our dogs were like best friends. <laughs> and um, so, you know, you talk and you talk every day, you see these people twice a day, you get to know them very well. So she became a good friend. And so when we moved away from New York, we kind of lost contact with her, but we would call her once in a while when we go back. And so I was like, I, and then that's when I said to Lindsay, you know, the person you, we, I have to introduce you to is Chris Hedges. Mm -hmm. She is the one, you know, that will help you. And Penny was um, getting older, you know, at mm -hmm. the time he was still alive, but um, you know, uh, quite famous. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, about his history, no. but uh, Chris Hedges, who is was the um, executive producer of the film, you know, was pretty much, I mean, married to the man who founded docu the documentaries, you know, the whole genre. And his name was um, Pennebaker. You know, his last name is, uh, it, it's it's, it's uh, Pennebaker Hedges Films. Oh. And, um, and, and his nickname was Penny. And so he uh, was uh, uh, 30 years older than, than Chris. You know, mm -hmm. she started as, as a um, an intern, you know, when she was 20. But she had been in the uh, documentary uh, industry, you know, for uh, 50 years. And so the she knew everyone, you know, in, in, the, in the business. So when I first uh, asked her, you know, I said, I never asked you for a favor before, Chris, but, you know, can I can I bring Lindsay to, to meet you? And so uh, they got along really well. The, the first time we met, we had dinner right on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, where we used to live, right, right near their apartment. And Penny was still there, of course, which was great. And, uh, you know, so uh, Lindsay was so thankful, you know, to be able to meet meet him and, and Chris. And um, so, you know, she gave her a little bit of advice, you know, about the story line. And then um, she had, she sent her back to go do more work, <laughs> you know, on the film and get it to a, another level. Right. And so that's what she did. And I tried to help her as much as I could, you know, to, right. to do that. But in about a year, she was ready to come back, come back, you know, meet Chris again after she had done this, this certain work that Chris had asked her to do. And so we met again for, you know, I was hoping that Chris would sign on, you know, as executive producer, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Get this whole film going uh, and bump it up to, a, you know, another level, which is where it needed to be. And, uh, and the second the second dinner did it. So they really clicked the second time around. And um and that was it. And so as soon as Chris Hedges got involved, the film like went completely up here. <laughs> I mean, there's you so know? much there's so much power in that film. Obviously, the whole story and and Julia and her story. And we talked about Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Harwitz. But you know, I was telling someone about it the other day, just the yeah. opening scene where they show ticks all over the country. You know, not just on Martha's Vineyard, not just in New England, not just in Lyme, Connecticut, but all over the country. When they open the documentary, you see people trapping ticks just in in places all over the place. Um, Enid, uh, just two last questions here. What should people expect when their loved one is is chronically uh, has chronic Lyme? What are some things that they should be aware of to be of better support? 
I think it's a good idea. I always tell them to read horror witches books mm -hmm. because, you know, I, they're like, I, I like to call it the Lyme Bibles because mm -hmm. they just have all the information there at your fingertips and they're written in such a way that you really can understand it. I think you purposely did that for Lyme patients um, or just, uh, you know, read, uh, you know, as much as you possibly can if, if, if you know, to help your partner because your partner probably can't read. That's it. That's one of the things that leaves you. You usually can't read with, I mean, I lost my ability to read and write with Lyme. Uh, before I got that pick line, I was like, couldn't function. So that all came back. Thank God, you know, after I got the pick line, but, um, you know, I think that the, to educate yourself as much as you can about the disease, because the patient can't really do that work for themselves very well. They're too sick yeah. and they really need an advocate you know, and their partner. You know, I actually read both of uh, Dr. Harwood's books, you know, the last one being, how can I get better? And for me, as someone who was interested in learning how someone close to me uh, was affected by Lyme, it was like a page turner. Every time I turn, and it's a thick book. I, I tell people, I tell people there's three kinds of books out there that I discovered online. There's the two inch thick books, like Dr. Harwitz wrote and, and Dan Kinderlair, who was on my show, wrote. And literally it was a page turner. Every page, I'm like, oh, that explains that. Oh, that explains that. So, um, and I also, once again, if you're watching today and you have someone with chronic Lyme in your life, I encourage you to read my book, Love, Hope, Lyme, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. And go back and listen to, to past episodes. You know, we talked today about Dr. Richard Harwitz, who was one of my first guests. Lindsay Keys was on the show. And, uh, you know, we talked about what she's trying to do now to continue uh, to get more impactful things done. And I'm really excited to hear some of the backstory about he, how you got her there. Um, Ian, and I just want to just acknowledge you again. Like I mentioned before, I didn't know this world existed two and a half years ago. Um, and then I just started meeting people who have devoted large parts of their life and energy for other people. And just want to acknowledge you for what you've done, continue to do for thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. And, you know, you were just telling me that you did the showings every week of under my skin Is it under my skin. Yeah. Under our skin, under our skin. And I've watched yeah. that too, as well. And it's um, just, you know, the support that you've bring. And again, you've connected so many people to find solutions. I didn't know some of the background of the early days of, of Dr. Harwitz, even though he's been on the show. And I just want to acknowledge you for that. I don't know how often you get acknowledged for what you've done in people's lives, but um, just want to acknowledge you for, for that. And it's, it's quite, it's quite special. Um, give us a final thought, any special, any final thoughts that you'd like to communicate to either the Lyme survivors listening today who are struggling with support. Like I told you, I wrote my book and I started the podcast. I presumed all my people were going to be spouses, parents, family members, friends, who wanted to learn more about this person in their life. And I've come to learn that a large portion, if not the majority, are people with Lyme who are looking to explain, to help people understand, I'm going through this with this ridiculous disease. Uh, give us a final thought or two to recommend to them. Yeah, I think the final thought would be like to, in your, in your own mind, believe that you are going to get better. That that's the thing that really helped us. Sorry, I get a little emotional about that, but yeah. um, that's the first thing Dr. Horowitz said to us when we came into his office. You know, after after we did everything, and we were so sick. You know, all three of us were so sick, and he just turned to us, and he the last thing he said actually it was the last thing he said after he heard our stories after nine hours and we're sitting there with him and he said, don't worry, you're going to get better. And I mean, we believed him you know, when he said that, because once you get that in your head, you know, that, you, that you're going to get better because it feels like you're never going to get better with this yeah. disease, you know, like there, it's just so brutal as, as you know, and how everybody knows that has this disease and it's different for everybody too, to find the right treatment and everything, but keep going, find the right treatment, keep looking. And there's one thing I have to say is where I live, this is a magical thing too. 
was, you know, so many coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences any, anymore because there's been so many wonderful things that have happened, you know, with, with me, like just meeting the right people at the right time. It's weird, but um, I think it's probably meant to be somehow. But uh, the message I want to tell the people too is um, there is a treatment right near where I live here in Quichi, Vermont, and it, it's, a, it's a, a magnets that are really, really helping. This was our final thing that we tried after I did the Dapsone treatment too with Dr. Horowitz. In fact, we have a little thing tomorrow we're doing with the Dapsone success patients. After I did the Dapsone after Germany, then I, I've really been in remission for almost four years from that's Lyme. Great. So that's a, that, I, that I will say that you can get better if you keep at it. And the magnets kind of pushed me over the final edge, you know, all of us. And it, they work if you find the right person. Her name's Joan Randall. I'm pushing her because mm -hmm. she's right in Woodstock, Vermont. And she's teaching other people to, to do this treatment too, including my daughter, who's learning how to do it right now uh, for the Martha's Vineyard people. You know, because she lives on Martha's Vineyard now, and she's uh, she wants to help other people get well. All right. Once again, I want to thank Enid Howard for being on today's show. My name is Fred Diamond, and this is the Love Hope Line podcast.